Hello and welcome to another edition of Study the Confessions. And this is part two of our study through the Synod of Dort. So let's just jump right in. Um, it would be helpful if you went back, uh, if you jumped into this session, if you watch session one. I mean, these things all build upon each other, but uh, I'll review very briefly if uh, this is the one you stumbled upon. Um, so today we're going to go over articles five and six, but we did one through four in the last session. And remember, the foundation that the uh, framers of the Synod of Dort started with is God's right to condemn all people. So the baseline foundation is that God is under no obligation to save anybody. And according to strict justice, he could just condemn the entire human race to eternal hell and the angels would still worship him, and he would still be glorious. And we talked about how that's really a tough uh, sell in the modern American evangelical church. Um, God is actually under the obligation on the opposite for many preachers. He's under the obligation to love everybody, and they, many of them stumble into functional universalism, although they would deny it um, in doctrine. But anyway, and then, um, you know, and this is disabusing us of the hyper-Calvinist, cage-stage Calvinist stuff, um, they jump right to the manifestation of God's love. So God's love is manifested. And John 3.16 is quoted right up front, um, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then, so that's Article 2. <clears throat> article 3 then continues to say the means by which this love of God is displayed and applied to uh, individuals is that they need to be brought to faith in Christ crucified. And this comes by the ministry of calling people to repentance and faith. And then they quote Romans 10, 14, and 15 about preaching. Then, so the, notice how this is very carefully, piece by piece, built up. Then, Article 4, we, so we have the gospel presentation, the love of God and his mercy going forth to a sinful, uh, deservedly condemned race in Adam. Adam's the federal head. We got to keep hitting that because that is a lost uh, doctrine in our in our land. Uh, the federal headship of Adam, and then we have a twofold response. So when this gospel goes forth, when the announcement of Christ crucified and the call to repent and believe go forth, um, God sends His church. He empowers them by the Spirit to bring this message forward. Um, it says God's wrath remains on those who do not believe the gospel, but those who do accept it and embrace it with the true and living faith are delivered from him from God's wrath and from destruction and receive the gift of eternal life. So, of course, there's two responses. I mean, this is all we should be able to agree on this. Arminian, non-reformed, traditionalist, provisionist, Calvinist. Uh, I don't think there's anything really uh, objectionable from an evangelical Protestant standpoint up to Article 4. I really don't. And I mentioned that. I think that uh, we can find some common ground here. There's nothing objectionable. And if there is, then you're really tiptoeing on denying functional, fundamental gospel issues. Um, so th there's two responses. Now, here's where we get into the debated part. So this is what we're on today, Article 5. And this article says, the sources of unbelief and of faith. Now, so let's, let's, let's read this and then we'll, I'll comment on it. The cause or blame for this unbelief, as well as for all other sins, is not at all in God, but in humanity. Faith in Jesus Christ, however, and salvation through him is a free gift of God. As scripture says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. Likewise, it has been freely given to you to believe in Christ, Philippians 1.29. Now, um, I was listening to R.C. Sproul uh, yesterday, and it's on Ligonier right now. Um, you know, it's just October 7th, 2019. Um, so over the weekend um, on Ligonier's uh, Renewing Your Mind broadcasts uh rc's going over i think he's in romans 9 i think he's going through romans uh he's preaching through romans at the church um but he was talking about this idea that's in here um the idea that it's not he called it symmetrical a symmetrical idea of god's influence upon the elect versus his influence on the reprobate so that's what this text that's what this first part of uh Dort is saying it's saying that God does not influence the non-elect, those who remain in their unbelief, in the same way he influences those who come to faith. 
So in other words, God does not have to do anything extra. He does not have to work unbelief into their heart in a intentional, purposeful way because individuals are already born in sin. So, and then in humanity, this, the, you know, the in Adam, Adam federal headship permeates and is foundational to understanding this. So this is going back to, well, the blame is in humanity. Well, in humanity, meaning in Adam. Um, but the cause for this or blame for this unbelief. So if, if you are unbeliever and you are unbelieving and you are rejecting the call to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, that is not God's fault that you're doing that. That is your fault because you are born a sinner and by nature you are not believing in God. By nature you um, hate God. And um, that will be revealed later in the Synod of Dort more deeply in the articles on total depravity and corruption. But then it says, faith in Jesus Christ, however, and salvation through him is a free gift of God. So they're making this distinction between the source of unbelief is in humanity and the source of faith is in God himself giving that gift of faith. Okay. And then they quote Ephesians 2.8. Now I have Ephesians 2.8 here up on the screen. Um, so there it is in the Greek, there it is in the New American Standard, English Standard, King James, America, Original American Standard Version, NIV. Um, they all read basically the same. Um, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, what's the debate, just, just very briefly, the exegetical debate on, so the exegetical debate here is this little phrase right here, kai tuta. See it? I'm highlighting it right there if you're watching. Kai tuta. Okay. So tuta is a demonstrative, nominative, neuter, singular pronoun. And of course, the, the debate is what is the referent, um, the antecedent in the previous part of the sentence? So, and I mean, this is basic English grammar. If you are saying in English and this, and you say it in the middle of a sentence, when you say that, um, you know, this pizza I had was really good and it was great. And this is why I am full. Well, this is referring to the pizza you ate, correct? Just basic, simple um, illustration I thought of. Um, so, kai tuta, what is it referring to? Is it the kariti este sesomenoi dia pisteos? So that means, so there it is, for by grace you are saved, perfect passive nominative, through faith, okay? So, the issue is, this is not of God, this is not of yourselves, of God the gift. So, this is a gift. See, so this is, this is where the Reformed use this text to say, okay, um, it is a gift. It is a gift of God. This is a gift of God. Well, what does the this refer to? Well, does it refer to grace? Does it refer to faith? Does it refer to salvation? Well, it can't refer to salvation because that's a participle, but we're looking into um, the, the nouns. There's two nouns here, right? There's grace and there's faith. Um, and just, just we don't have to spend a ton of time on this. I, I highly recommend if you are digging deeper into the stuff, you get this book. Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics by Daniel Wallace. This book is revolutionary. Because, of course, I'm, I'm going to have a whole video about this, but, of course, this is grammar, mounts. This is what I used in seminary. And this is syntax, okay, if you're learning Greek. So grammar, of course, is the alphabet, uh, the pronouncing the words, vocabulary, and basic uh, grammar. Uh, what's a noun? What's a verb? What's an adjective? What's a participle? What's a case, number, gender? Uh, etc. How would, what are the different verbs? What are the different forms? This is more in depth of, okay, once you've learned the grammar, how do you understand the different uses of all the grammar in the Greek language? Uh, so, and this is referenced um, in my Bible works, which they don't, I didn't realize till recently that they quit making Bible works, but I have this old Bible works eight version that works fine for me. Um, anyway, um, if you go down, I have Wallace's exegetical syntax of the New Testament. It's, it's so great. It's all built in here. And if you click on this one, here's the discussion that's also in this book on Ephesians 2.8. And he gives four possible interpretations, gives the reasons for each. Now, we're not going to go through this. 
Um, but this is highly debated if you are into the debating of Reformed theology versus synergism, Arminianism. Um, because this is a very clear text. Um, and of course, the Synod of Dort is quoting it to say, faith is a gift of God. Um, now, he comes down and basically says it refers the antecedent, meaning what is the pronoun referring to, refers to the whole clause um, is usually the main interpretation. I think has the most uh, weight to it is uh, the salvation by grace through faith is a gift of God. So, of course, that includes faith. But is this some kind of definitive text for uh, faith as a gift? No, it's it's not. It's, you know, some Reformed people will say it is, but it's it, it doesn't, it's not as straightforward as people want to make it say. Um, now, the next text, I think, is is more powerful. Philippians 1.29, if you're familiar with Philippians 1.29, let's look at that very briefly. Philippians 1.29, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Okay, and then you have the word here. Uh, karizomai, um, which means to give freely. So this this uh, word means to give and be granted something. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the uses of the word, but this is the consistent um, translation in all the major translations. It has been given to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in his name, but to suffer. So just as suffering is a gift from God through Christ has been given to us as believers, also the very faith we have is a gift from God. So I think that's a pretty pretty good text there. So th these are the two proof texts that are given in the Synod of Dort. And of course, you know, we don't want to fall into the error of saying that God, in the same way he works uh, faith into his elect and gives them that free gift by a powerful action of his might and power, um, he works the same way it, uh, in making the uh, sinners and the non-elect be unbelievers. That is not um, at all what the synod says. And that's sometimes what um, is, 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 is claimed Reformed theology teaches. Oh, God, God is, God is actively keeping people who want to believe out of the kingdom. He's, 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 he's pushing them away. They so desperately want to be saved, but God is hardening them and causing them to not believe, even though they want to believe. There will be people in the day of judgment who will say, God, I wanted to believe, but you wouldn't let me because you reprobated me. Uh, that is not what Reformed theology teaches. Reformed theology teaches that individuals, because of their union with Adam, because of the corruption that flows from Adam, don't want to believe in the first place because of their nature. Now, we could get into a debate, and we will, and we'll talk about it. Uh, what is the inter-Reformed debate about you know, God and the issue of double predestination and the issue of infralapsarian versus supralapsarian? And if you're new, uh, you'll learn all these terms. Uh, but in, just at a basic level... God is not actively needing to harden unbelievers because they already are hardened in their sin. They're already corrupted. They already have no desire to believe. But as for the elect, God works this faith into them. Okay, Article 6. Now, let's talk about God's eternal decree. Now, this is so foundational to reform theology. And we need to do a deep dive study into it. Um, you know, and I, this isn't really done as much as, you know, I've, I've been reformed for a while now and it is hard to find a in-depth, uh, deep study of God's decrees from a biblical standpoint. Where is this concept of decree taught? Um, how is it unfolded in scripture? Um, and I do have some good stuff on it that I've read from, from some reformed authors that I got my hands on, uh, recently, uh, especially Herman Hoeksema. I'm really enjoying Herman Hoeksema. He has uh, got some very good material on some of these things. Um, but Article 6. So let's read this and then we'll go over it. Uh, and, this, and this is what we'll wrap up with for this edition. Um, the fact that some receive from God the gift of faith within time and that others do not stems from his eternal decree. For, quote, all his works are known to God from eternity. Acts 15, 18, and then, he quotes, then they quote Ephesians 1, 11. In accordance with this decree, God graciously softens the hearts, however hard, of the elect and inclines them to believe. But by a just judgment, God leaves in their wickedness and hardness of heart those who have not been chosen. And in this especially is disclosed to us God's act, unfathomable and as merciful as it is just, 
of distinguishing between people equally lost. This is the well-known decree of election and reprobation revealed in God's word. The wicked, impure and unstable, distort this decree to their own ruin, but it provides holy and godly souls with comfort beyond words. Okay, that's I, I like the way they wrote this. Now, let's break this down. So now we have the reformed explanation as to why some receive the gift of faith in time and others do not. Now, this is a very foundational issue, and this is the debate. Um, this is very honing in on the very uh, nub of the debate here. So we all agree that we're in Adam. I would hope if you don't, you're not evangelical. I'm sorry. If you think that Adam's sin does not affect us and we are not um, judicially held accountable for Adam's sin, which is denied in traditionalism and provisionism. I mean, they, they just deny the federal headship of Adam. It's, it's really scary. Uh, but let's, let's assume that we agree with that and that the gospel, and God has shown his love in sending his son to die and that that gospel proclamation goes out. But the issue is, why does one person end up believing and the other person does not? And you basically have the synergistic camp that says the reason why some people come to faith and others don't is because God is trying, he's doing everything he can do to bring them to faith. But in order for regeneration, for repentance and faith, for the gift of God to happen in that person's life, they have to cooperate. So, so synergism, remember, is two powers that come together that produce the result. Okay, So synergistic, two energies, two forces, two powers, synergy. Um, God, in his part, does his part. And then in order for the result, which is someone to have true repentance and faith and salvation, in order for that result to occur, human freedom, libertarian freedom, where they could choose or not choose, they could choose otherwise, to accept it, those two things come together, and then the result is um, regeneration and salvation. That's a synergistic position. The monergistic position, uh, Calvinistic position, reform position, is that, no, the reason why one believes and one does not has to do with God and his action alone. Monergism says it is one power that creates the result, namely God's power alone. We bring no power to the table. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are corrupted by Adam's sin, and we have no ability or desire to repent and believe until God first works a miracle of regeneration. Now, here's where even synergistic and Arminian systems have to at least agree with us up to a certain point, or else they fall into Pelagianism. Um, they have to agree that at least God, for his part, does some action first. Or else they just end up denying our union with Adam completely and the effects of Adam's sin. So God at least has to do something. Um, they call it provenient grace, where God's grace that goes before and lifts people so far out of their sin until the neutral point almost so that they can believe. And we'll, we'll go over some good Arminian uh, explanations of provenient grace in future episodes. Um, because we really want to understand what they mean by that. But anyway, I'm going off. This is what I do. I'm sorry. I ramble on. Uh, let's go back to this. Um, so what is the um, source of God's action in time where some are given the gift of faith and others are not? Well, it's his eternal decree. Now, let's do a little textual criticism here. Um, for those of you, some of you, you know, I listen to James White all the time, and he always says this. Oh, some of you tune off because we're going to talk about textual criticism. Um, but I love this stuff. I think it's great. You know, a textual criticism, meaning, you know, the idea of how can we go back and reconstruct the original writings of the apostles by comparing the copies that we have extant of the New Testament writings in the original languages and the early translations, et cetera, et cetera. So when I first read this, you know, if you have an ESV, if you have an NIV, um, if you have one of those translations, it doesn't read this way. So if we go to Acts 15, 18, um, it says, like, so look, known from of old, um, that have been known for ages. So what's the context here? Let's look at the context. Remember, this is where um, James, is it James? Yeah, so this is, this is the Jerusalem Council, and this is where... Um, 
After they spent speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from their people his name. And with this words, the prophets agreed, just as is written. Now he quotes Amos. After this, I will return. I will behold the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. It's interesting right there, right? The Gentiles who will seek the Lord, the ones who are called by my name. Says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Interesting, huh? Very interesting. So I wanted to look into this because, you know, the Greek, what's the what's behind the original Greek language? So if you look, um, this is quoted by the, the writers of the Synod of Dort. All his works are known to God from eternity. Well, I started looking at the translations and the King James um, quotes it, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Uh, then you have the Geneva Bible. From the beginning of the world, God knoweth all his works. Uh, the authorized standard, or the American, is it the, yeah, the, is it the American standard version? Saith the Lord, who makes, maketh these things known from of old. And then the New American Standard says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So it's interesting. So the King James Version, you know, quotes it. It's kind of the way that they're quoting it in Dort. Now, I looked into this, so here's a little, you know, more resources that you need to get your hands on if you want to study this. You need to get the textual commentary in the Greek New Testament by Metzger. Here it is. Um, now, this is a cool book because as they were going through um, and uh, constructing the critical edition of the New Testament text, I'm not sure which text this is. I, I should know that, but, you know, there, all, of course, there's an S.C. Allen and then there's the UBS. I think this is UBS right? United Bible Society. Yeah, this is when they were compiling United Bible Society Greek text. This is the notes they took and they give a score for the questionable readings. So in this text, the Acts 15, 18 text. So they, they give this a C score, meaning that they don't, um, it's questionable whether this last clause was in the original. Um, let me find it, 15, 18, sorry, because it's a real quick little comment that they give on it. Um, 15, 18, where is it? 15, 18. Um, so the questionable um, is gnosta ap ionos. Ionos. Yeah, I need to practice my Greek reading. It's, it's leaking out. Gnosta ap ionos. Um, so that's the term that, that is um, from... Uh, etern known from eternity. Um, and then here's what they say. Since the quotation from Amos 9.12 ends with Tauta, the concluding words are James's comment. The reading Gnosta ap Inos, however, is so elliptical an expression that copyists made various attempts to recast the phrase, rounding it out as an independent sentence. So in other words, they don't believe that the original, it's, it's, it's unlikely, but it could, it could be original. They're not saying it's not. They give it a C rating. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the uh, CGBM ends up spitting this out as the, um, anyway, um, it says, so this edition of known unto God are all his works from the, this is, this is an edition. So it must be in the Texas Receptus. See, I don't know all this. I don't know. It must be in the, the TR. It must be in the uh, text that underlies the King James Version in the Geneva Bible because it's it it these are the only things words they think are original and in order because it doesn't make sense right look known from of old that's not a complete sentence so they're saying that the scribes tried to make that sound like a complete sentence by adding um, the Lord who makes these things known so you know interesting um, another influence there by the uh, the Greek text of the time when the Synod of Dort writers were doing their work. But of course, Ephesians 1.11 has no textual problems and is a powerful verse for understanding the decree of God that governs what happens in time. Okay, So Ephesians 1.11 reads, Having been predestined according to the purpose of of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The bulein to thelematos autu. So this is the clause, this is the phrase. So 
So, so, so the apostles writing, we have obtained this inheritance and where did the inheritance come from? How did they obtain it? When was the inheritance decided that it would be given to them? Well, it's because they were predestined according to the purpose of him who does what? So God does what? He works all things, all things, tapanta, according to the counsel of his will. The bulein to thelemos out to. Do we need to sit there and interpret it? It's very clear that all things are worked together according to the purpose of him who has the counsel of his will. His will is what governs what happens in time. A very strong verse. A very powerful verse. A very comforting verse for a believer. Now, let me, let me keep going here. I don't want this video to go, to go super long here. In accordance with this decree... So the decree, the, the, the purpose of him who works all things out according to the counsel of his will, God graciously softens the hearts, however hard, of the elect and inclines them to believe. So this is the good news. This is the reformed understanding of how it is that some people come to faith in Jesus Christ. That God, because of his decree, because of his will that he decided before time began, he softens the hearts, however hard, what good news, Thank you, Jesus. My heart was hard. Um, in my addiction, I was, I'm a recovering drug and alcohol addict, and I was in my addiction running hard from him almost 20 years ago, and he came in, and he came into my life. It didn't matter how hard my heart is. He was able to soften it because of his power, and I thank him for that. And he does that, and he inclines them to believe. Now, praise him. That's what he does. That's, that's our God who we worship and serve, the God who saves. And he does it without our help. He is able to save us, no matter how hard of a heart we have. But, remember, we're talking about what's the difference between those who believe and those who don't. But by a just judgment, God leaves in their wickedness, very important. So this is a just judgment. This isn't unfair. Remember, we already talked about this in Article 1. God would be just to leave everyone in their sins. But by a just judgment, God leaves in their wickedness and hardness of heart those who have not been chosen. Well, that's not fair. Well, if you want fair, the category of fair is judgment for all. The category of mercy is salvation of some and leaving the rest under what they deserve. Okay? There is no injustice done. Justice would be to leave everyone in their wickedness and sins. Remember, the category of mercy is a different category than justice. Justice is the default category in light of our union with Adam, his sin, and how we are by nature. Mercy is a category that is not something that is demanded from this, the, the case that's going on, namely that we are in Adam sinners. And the justice is the category that should fall on us. Mercy is a category of God's sovereign act, where in the midst of this fallen race, he chooses to show mercy to some, something he does not have to do, and something that is not demanded. He does it freely and graciously. Okay, so this is very important to understand the doctrine of predestination. Many people frame the doctrine of predestination as if God just looks down and for in an arbitrary fashion, without any foundational issues to be discussed first, just goes heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell. Okay. From our point of view, I'll say that very importantly, because I think that some Calvinists kind of shy away at the end of the day from the ultimate sovereignty of God just to govern his universe however he wants. But from our point of view, from our perspective, this is not how it goes. It's not heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell. From, from our perspective, God says, hell to everyone. That's the first thing. We all deserve it because of our union with Adam and him as him our federal head. Then from that hell to the mass of humanity, from that mass, he chooses some to rescue and be trophies of his grace and mercy. There's nothing unjust about that. You might not like it, 
but there's nothing unjust about it. It is just. It is a just judgment. And then notice he leaves them in their wickedness and hardness of heart. Once again, God doesn't have to actively harden them because they're already in wickedness and hardness of heart. We are by nature, apart from the regenerating work of God, in our wickedness and hardness of heart, and we would never believe. So God just has to leave us in our state. He doesn't have to actively harden the reprobate in order to keep them from believing. Okay? Now, this is what some scriptures in the Gospels will be twisted by the synergists to say, look, Jesus said if this would have happened, they would have believed. So it's be, they, they could believe. It's just, it's just they don't want to believe because, you know, and they, they kind of, they twist it around. This is saying that individuals will stay in their unbelief unless God does something first, which you have to agree with unless you just want to go the Pelagian route. And this is especially disclosed to us in God's act unfathomable and as merciful as it is just of distinguishing between people equally lost. You hear, see, so they, so they even, they, they, they repeat it again. So it's an unfathomable act. So we, we must bow in reverence to how God makes this decision. But it is merciful and just. So these two categories are held together. God is a merciful God, but he's also a just God. And he distinguishes between people, listen, this is very important, equally lost. So you have no business if you're reformed to sit here and talk about how, um, you know, you are somehow inherently better than somebody who's not a believer. You are no different than the unbeliever. If you have regeneration and you have repentance and faith and you are following Christ today um, and you see the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of regeneration and you are repenting of your sins daily and you are believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ and loving him and loving his gospel and rejoicing in the righteousness you have in Christ and rejoicing in his sacrifice for you on the cross, you're equally as lost. You were equally as lost as everyone else. You're no better. The only thing that distinguishes you is God's merciful act. And that's it. And that's the glory of Reformed theology is I can't boast about anything. I have no credit to be taken for that I know Christ and repent of my sins and believe in someone else does not. This is the well-known decree of election and reprobation revealed in God's word. The wicked, impure, and unstable distort this decree to their own ruin, but it provides holy and godly souls with comfort beyond words. Now this is, you know, getting into the pastoral problem of the doctrine of election. Um, and it's very well known. Um, I've experienced it myself. Well, if what you're saying, Dave, is that some people are predestined for heaven and some people are predestined for hell, I probably would assume that I'm the one predestined for hell. So I'll just live in sin because there's no hope for me anyway. And I'll just go off and do drugs and, and do whatever I want to do and sin against God. And there's nothing I can do about it anyway, because I'm already reprobate. Now, of course, the, the, the error in that type of thinking is you can't know you don't have access to that information. I don't have a copy of the book of life sitting in front of me where I can look up your name and see if you're in it. We do not know who the elect are. We do not know the identity of the elect. So that's one way the wicked use this to uh, prop themselves up. But even, you know, and I want to go over some of these quotes because I think Luther in the bondage of the will, man, he has some quotes where, um, you know, he... He, he, he toys with this idea of, you know, the, the classic Lutheran distinction between the law and the gospel. Let me just say this real quick because it's important. Um, the classic Lutheran distinction between the law and the gospel is that the law causes you to be hopeless in the sense of you can never obey God's commandments enough to merit his righteousness. Um, and of course, that's powerful and it's a proclamation that needs to happen in the church that the law of God needs to be put upon the people in such a way that they despair of ever keeping it by their own works. And then that drives them to the gospel because they see that Christ is the one who obeyed the law in our place. He provides us with that righteousness. He gives us the righteousness we need that the law demands, but we can never live up to. Christ lives up to it and gives it to us as a gift, right? That's the distinction between the law and the gospel. But Luther has a few quotes in Bondage of the Will that I can show you where he even takes a step deeper and he almost turns the proclamation of the doctrine of election into a form of God's law that brings us to desperation. In other words, the, the, the proclamation that the only way you would ever have repentance and faith is that God has to regenerate you and you have to be of the elect can actually function in a positive way of bringing someone to the point where they go, well, if that's the case, I'm lost. And if that's the case, the only one that can save me is God. And then that actually is a means that's used to bring about 
the person crying out to God because they know that unless God chooses me, unless God regenerates me, unless God gives me faith, I'll never believe. And that actually causes you to be desperate. So anyway, that's just, a, you know, some people would disagree that that is what you do with the doctrine of election. Now, many Reformed scholars and pastors that I respect would say, listen, the doctrine of election, you need to, um, you know, it's a family secret, they'll say. It's something that comes later. Um, you're not to preach it up front that way. Just preach the law of the gospel in the in the first way I said and call people to repentance and faith, which, you know, in, 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 in my more balanced uh, times, I agree with that. But there's some times where I go off on this tangent about, but what about, can the doctrine of election be used to, to show people that they're, they're so desperate, they have to have a power of God to, to, to regenerate them? But they, you know, that can go off the deep end um, if you're not careful. But what does the doctrine of election do to holy and godly souls? There's comfort beyond words. In other words, if you are the of the elect, if you see the fruit of the Spirit working in your mind and your heart and you see repentance happening in faith and you're growing in your faith and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is working in you and you, you see God's providence in your life and you see that you're loving His Word, you see all these things increasing in your life, what a comfort that you have that you know that, number one, that gift was given to you by God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't do anything to have it. He gave it to you because he elected you before time began. And then, of course, what's the comfort that he will bring you to the end? He who began a good work in you will bring it to the completion on the day of Christ Jesus, right? We know that because of the election of God, that nothing can separate us from his love because we are his chosen. Christ is interceding for us. We are his people and God will bring us to the end. If we had nothing to do with the beginning of our salvation, we will have, we don't have to have something to do with the end. We will persevere because God will preserve us and we will get into perseverance. So let's, let's wrap it up here, but um, I hope this helped you. Article five and six, we said a lot, but we will continue our study through the Synod of Dort. Uh, thank you for joining me and I hope you join me next time. Thank you and God bless.